Mount. So that's Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to be reading from verses 1 to 6, and then on from verses 16 to 18. Matthew 6, 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And then from verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber, as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let me just pray for us um, and then take a look at this passage together. Father God, thank you that though you are unseen, though to us in some ways you are in secret, you see us, and that is a wonderful thing. As we look at this passage this morning, may that become more real to us, and would that thought bring us great comfort and great joy, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. About um, 15 years ago, I was asked to lead the prayers uh, in the meeting on a, a summer camp that I was a part of. It was quite an organized summer camp, and they had a folder of briefings about how to do various tasks. And there were some helpful pointers on how to lead prayer in one of their meetings. And it was good stuff. Um, don't just pray for inward-looking concerns for the camp. Pray for outward-looking concerns for the world. Um, you know, find out what the reading is that evening, what the theme is, try and pray in line with that theme. And you read down, and the last point was this. Most importantly, pray up. There's no point in praying if people at the back can't hear. And some legend had written underneath in Biro, why is God at the back? Now I get it. The notes were making a fair point. If you're leading in prayer in a meeting, then you are leading the meeting in prayer. And so it's really helpful if everyone in the room can hear you. But what that cheeky scamp who had defaced those notes, well, they had a point as well. When we pray in public, when we do anything Christian in public, who are we doing it for? Are we doing it for the people in the room? for the people watching online? Or are we doing it for God? When we pray, are we praying to God or the crowd? Are we praying for God or for the crowd? Now again, whoever wrote those notes was concerned ultimately that we'd be led well in prayer together to God. But it is easy for us to think more about the people in the room who we can see the people we know are watching online, than actually for us to be thinking about God. It is possible to pray, to preach, to lead worship, just for the people in the room, just for the applause, and not actually for our Heavenly Father at all. 
Well, the last few weeks we've been focusing on righteousness. And in the last verse of chapter 5, if you've got a Bible, you may want to take a look. In the last verse of chapter 5, Jesus finished, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the danger is that as we reach for perfection, the greater the risk is that we are tempted towards hypocrisy to pretend that we've reached it, hoping to please the audience, not our Father. And so just after Jesus says, be perfect, the very next thing he says, 6 verse 1, is be careful. Be perfect, but be careful. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. But if we've been paying close attention all the way through, then isn't this a contradiction of what Jesus said back in chapter 5, verse 15. There he said this, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds. Whereas here Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. In both verses, Jesus is talking about doing good works. And in both verses, Jesus is talking about being seen. In the first verse, Jesus says we should do our good works where they can be seen. And in the second, Jesus says, don't do your good works where they can be seen. Well, what's going on? Two things. We need to see that there is a difference in the good works that Jesus is talking about. In verse 15, Jesus is speaking of the commands that follow immediately after. Commands against anger and lust. Commands to keep our word and our marriage vows. Commands to love without limits, as we heard last week, our neighbor, the needy, even our enemy. And these are commands that we can only keep as people in relationship. They relate to things that we do or don't do in the presence of other people. Jesus there is calling us to a public righteousness, a righteousness that makes us visibly different from the world around us, as we keep our word, stay faithful to our spouse, love our enemies. Whereas here where Jesus says, be careful, again he's speaking about the commands that follow immediately after, but here these commands are about giving and praying and fasting. Not about public righteousness, but about Christian devotion. You might say about religious acts. But although the nature of of the good deeds is different. The temptation for us in both situations is the same, that we care more about what people think than about what God thinks. You see, out in the world, we're tempted to hide the things we do as Christians that make us different because we want people to like us and approve us and think well of us. But in the church, surrounded by people who we think think the same things and believe the same things, then here we are tempted to show off the religious things that we do. Out in the world where we're liable to be mocked for looking religious, for not swearing or gossiping, to be called weird or self-righteous or worse, for not getting drunk or keeping sex for marriage, then the temptation is to keep our heads down out in the world. But in the church, looking religious can get a status or praise. Oh, what wonderful prayers. Oh, what great music. Oh, what a good sermon. It's a different context. It's a different behavior. But the reward that we can be tempted to chase is the same. The praise of people. One writer sums it up this way. Jesus tells us to show when we are tempted to hide and to hide when we're tempted to show. So to address our cowardice in the world, Jesus says, let your light shine. And to address our vanity in the church, Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. And if we do, well, Jesus says, if you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. It's possible to pray and give and worship. And it's all for show 
all because we want the applause of people. And if that is our goal, then we'll have no reward from our Father in heaven. You see, at first glance, you might think that this is a passage about giving and praying and fasting. But actually, it's, it's not focused on those. Jesus goes into no detail. In fact, he just assumes that we will. When you give, when you pray, when you fast. That's worth saying that probably for most of us, fasting is the least familiar of those. And if fasting is something that you're not familiar with at all, well, I found a great article, A Beginner's Guide to Fasting, which I'll put in the YouTube description and send around on email if you'd like to read that. But Jesus' concern here isn't to give us detail on giving and praying and fasting. Jesus' main point is when we give, when we pray, when we fast, who are we trying to impress? Who is our audience? God or other people? And it's so important. Jesus has a very strong word for us if our audience is other people. Hypocrites. Verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Now, hypocrite wasn't always an insult. It was just the word for the actors in the Greek theater who wore masks to show their mood. Happy mask, sad mask, angry mask. A mask that hid their true face underneath. And Jesus says that is what we become when we do our religious acts to impress others. We become actors. The church becomes our stage, a place to play a role. Our seeming acts of devotion to God are like masks that we put over our faces, put over our true faces in order to get, well, in order to be honored, in order to be seen, in order to show off. You see, there's a bit of verse five that sounds great. They love to pray, but what they really love is not the God they're praying to, but the praise they know they can get if they use the holy sounding words, just the right pitch and pace and pause. Oh, so elegant, so theologically wise, so educated. People who love to be seen to pray more than they love to pray. Of course, it's obvious you can do that as a preacher as well. All the right words, even all the right emotion on the surface, but your heart is somewhere else entirely. Similarly with giving, Jesus says that the hypocrites, they would blow a trumpet to let the people know that they were coming. Now they would have said, oh, I'm blowing a trumpet so that the needy know that now is the time for them to gather so that I can give alms to the needy. And Jesus says, actually, it was so that everyone could see their generosity. John Stott says, if that's the case, our giving is not an act of mercy, but an act of vanity. And so Jesus says, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Now, he's not saying, close your eyes, put your left hand behind your back, put your right hand in your pocket, take out a note, put it in the basket without checking what it is. Elsewhere in the Bible, Paul says, each should give what they have decided in their heart to give. So we should consider. But Jesus is saying he knows that we can do our own religious acts, sometimes not even for the benefit of others, but for the benefit of ourselves, so that we feel good about ourselves. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, I can put on quite a nice religious show for myself in the privacy of my own room. I can put on quite a nice religious show for myself in the privacy of my own room. So when we give, Jesus says, don't reflect over and over and over on it. Don't gloat on it. Oh, I'm such a generous person. I'm such a good person. How good of me, how helpful I can be. But Jesus says, give and move on. 
grateful to God for the opportunity to give, grateful for the good that we can do in the world, but not to reflect it back on ourselves. And the same with fasting. Jesus says that the hypocrites want to show others they are fasting, so they wouldn't put oil on their faces, they'd leave their hair in a mess. Jesus says, no, no, carry on as normal. Wash your face, moisturize, do your hair if you can. Just crack on as normal. But the trouble is we're so desperate for someone to know, aren't we? When we're doing something good, we really want someone to know. Even if it's just one close friend or someone else in the church, we long to let it slip what we gave or to let people know that we've been fasting. Because we want to be approved. We want to be thought worthy. We want to feel worthy. We want to feel special. And the thing is, Jesus says, if that is what we're searching for, we can get it. Jesus says the hypocrites get their reward in full. And the word there, in full, is a technical term for commercial transactions. It meant to receive a sum in full and give a receipt for. Jesus says if that's what we're seeking, we can get it. And we'll get it in full, but that's all we'll get. The only reward we'll get is the praise that we were seeking from other people. And how long does that last? Praise from others. How much praise is enough? A reporter once asked Elvis Presley, Elvis, when you first started playing music, you said you wanted to be rich, famous, and happy. You're now rich and famous. Are you happy? To which Elvis replied, I'm lonely as hell. And that was six weeks before he died. Nicole Kidman said that it was winning an Oscar in 2002 that made her realize how empty her life was. Whether we get the credit out in the world for being the best at what we do, or whether we get the credit in church for being the best at being religious, at the end of the day, we still go home to look at ourselves in the mirror and be faced with the horrifying reality that our true self is nothing like the mask that we put on in public. See, Jesus says there's only one audience that matters. In verse 1, your father. Verse 4, your father. Verse 6, twice, your father, your father. Verse 18, twice, your father, your father. Our father sees all that we do. When we give, there's only one audience that matters. When we pray, there's only one audience that matters. When we fast, there's only one audience that matters. Our Father sees it all, and we don't need to impress Him. We don't need to impress Him. If we've put our trust in Christ, it's not just that somewhere on a heavenly spreadsheet there's a tick that says, sins forgiven, righteous. If we've put our trust in Christ, we've been adopted into a new family. We are children, children of our Heavenly Father, and that changes everything. A few years back, a friend of mine with teenage children wrote a number of reflections on his experience of parenting, and one of the things he said was that for the first 10 years or so of parenting, a huge part of his job as father was just to say, I see you. Yes, I see what you are doing. I am watching you. I see you and I love you. Of course, he said once they become teenagers, it becomes the exact opposite. And so for us, this changes everything. We get a reward not from the world, but from our Father when we are seeking his approval and no one else's. When we are, when we are looking to him, we're looking to him as the audience of one. Jesus says, your Father who is in heaven, your Father who sees, your Father who is unseen, he will reward you. He's, he will reward us that as we give, that we will get a pure joy in seeing the good that our giving does when we give to please no one but our Father. And when we know that our Father sees and knows and loves us and that we don't need anyone else to know about it, then we can just enjoy the good of the gift. And when we pray, we don't need to impress others and we don't need to impress God. I don't know about you, I sometimes catch myself when I'm praying, praying in a way and realizing I'm trying to impress God. 
with what I'm saying. And sometimes in those moments, I admit to God how ridiculous that is because he knows what's in my mind. Martin Luther said, prayer is the conversation of the dependent and trusting child who is eager to voice their requests. Not so long ago, as, as I was talking to some little kids, um, some of my nieces and nephews, uh, they were telling me in great detail about aspects of their life. And I remembered myself doing that to my father. And of course, I was smiling and nodding and being very interested in, in what they were telling me about because I love them. And remembering back to the detail that I went into, explaining to my dad about this He-Man figure and that He-Man figure and, you know, this one and the special powers of this guy and that guy and the other guy, and thinking, wow, my dad was so patient and so loving because that was so boring looking back, so childish, but I was a child. And my father loved me and listened to me. And that is how our father listens to us. Not, a, not disapproving, not, saying, not thinking, do you measure up? Are these the right words? But loving that we are coming before him to speak to him. And so every day Jesus says, get alone with God, unseen, unheard by others. Maybe that's harder in lockdown in our, in our flats. Maybe it needs to be in the bathroom. Don't take your phone, just pray. And lastly, Jesus says, when you fast, that if we're doing it for God and for no one else, then we can fast truly to deepen our dependence on God or for repentance or remorse or for guidance, whatever the reason that we're fasting. The Pharisees twisted it so it was for other people. And again, we can be tempted to mention it, to let others know what we're doing. And Jesus says, no, just carry on as you are so that no one knows except you and your Father. This isn't a telling off passage from Jesus. It's a gloriously liberating passage. Jesus isn't taking anything away from us except something which was worthless in the first place, the approval of others. And he gives us a gift, the love, the approval, the acceptance of our Father. Let's pray. Father God, even now, the search to find the right words. But you know, you know the hearts of each and every one of us listening. You know where we are tempted, where we have that longing, that desire for others to see us, to approve us, to like us, to praise us. Father, please fill us with such a knowledge of your presence such a knowledge of your love that that will be enough for us to give, to pray, to fast, knowing that you see and that is enough. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.